When my friends read some of the Apostle Paul's letters and other passages in the Bible, they assume that the Bible teaches the idea that women are less than men in God's eyes. How do I lovingly counter that idea in my conversations? And I'll tag on with another related. In, in the Old Testament, it does seem to be that women are not treated as with, with much dignity, as much with dignity as men. Um, when referenced even the beating of wives. So how do we negotiate and wrestle with those kind of difficult passages, seemingly? Sure. Great. Um, well, I've been asked sort of not to get into the detail of how we kind of organize churches around this, um, but I can get, certainly give you my view on how um, uh, I think pers negative perceptions of Paul actually are false and need to be understood in the context of um, the wider New Testament. Um, so the f I think the first thing that I would say is um, really probably there are, uh, are three specific passages of Paul's writing that um, people who um, are troubled by him would refer to and they would be from 1 Corinthians 11 about headship and they would be from 1 Corinthians 14 about women being silent in the church. And then from 1 Timothy chapter 2 where um, there are a couple of verses talk, uh, written to Timothy um, which also refer to the Adam and Eve that it was the women who sinned first and so women can't have authority in the church or teach but they need to bear children if they want to be saved. You know the, um, the verses. So um, I would encourage you to, uh, to look those up and study them if you want to in depth and um, online there are sort of videos of me going in more depth into how, into how I would answer those. But I would say that if you're going to um, take those three passages and try to make a case that Paul regarded women as um, less than men, um, you, you, you would have to discount everything I just said from Romans 16, just one verse. But other evidence as well, Paul's treatment, for example, of Lydia, who asks him um, in the book of Acts, can the church in Philippi, can the church meet in her house? And he had to think about it. Why? Because the first Christian in any place had the church meeting in their oikos, in their household, and were the quasi or de facto leader of that early Christian community. And he came back and said, yes, the church can meet in your house. We um, hear Paul commending Philip's four daughters who prophesied. So however we see Paul, he's definitely not a misogynist. He um, loved working alongside women. He affirmed the ministry of, of Phoebe using extraordinary words about her and, and those other ten women that I mentioned in Romans 16. Um, so how do we understand then these, these other three passages? Well, 1 Corinthians 14, I think, is quite simple um, to, to understand because although it speaks of women being silent, even a few chapters earlier in the same letter, Paul has told women how they're to conduct themselves while they prophesy, cover their hair, do it with modesty, in other words. So clearly he doesn't think, be silent all the time. He's addressing a, a specific issue of disturbance in the Corinthian church. The passage actually comes in a context of multiple disturbances that are being addressed and so he's saying you know if you don't understand what's going on don't chatter away and distract other people um, ask a husband or, or another person who does understand what's going on after the service you need to be quiet and not not disturb people um, the 1 Corinthians 11 passage, which speaks about um, this word kephali, headship, I think um, there are different ways of, of understanding that, and different churches have, have different ways of the practical outworking of what that actually means. But given the theology within the verse that God is the head of Christ, God is kephali of Christ, and the man is kephali of the woman, what we know is that this is not hierarchical. If this is a hierarchical understanding of worldly domination or subjugation in some way, the man being a head of a woman, then God is the head of Christ. That's a classic heresy. 
that God the Father is greater than God the Son. That destroys the Trinity. So the key to interpreting that passage is in the passage itself. And there are a number of options of, of ways of working that out without having a hierarchy within the Trinity. None of them mean that a woman is subjugated or that somehow Genesis 127 is dissipated or undone um, by that text. And we can see clearly Paul's teaching, we're all one in Christ Jesus, male, female, etc. The way that he worked with women that he didn't believe that either. And the 1 Timothy um, 2 passage, which more specifically relates to church order. I mean, do you want me to go into that? Or you may, or maybe you could read what I think about that. Um, but again, I would say that um, the context itself, the fact that Paul ends with that strange verse about women being saved through childbearing, alerts us to the fact that there's something specific, something particular going on in the Ephesian church. And if we're going to raise that verse above all of these others, the verses affirming Priscilla who taught, the verses affirming Phoebe, Junia, Mary, or all of everything else I've been saying, because of that one passage, I think we need to, to be careful. We need to interpret scripture with scripture. And um, you can read more about it. I encourage you to, to dig into it. But I think the key to understanding that 1 Timothy 2 passage is the Ephesian context. Um, yeah, my book um, is the Bible, um, what's it called in America, that book? It's the Bible Intolerance, sorry, it has a different title here. Um, there's a whole chapter on, on that question.